Picture this, you're a doctor like me, trained in family practice and emergency medicine, and you're doing a day of social security disability exams, and you get a retired Marine with the most common problem you see. He's eaten up with arthritis in all different joints. And he looks like your typical tough guy Marine with the buzzed hair and the lack of be overweight. And you do your exam, note what all joints are messed up, and you finish up and tell him that you've got what you need. And he bursts into tears and starts telling you about how he feels useless because he can't play sports with the boys in his family. What would you do? Would you tell him his time's up and he needs to go home? I didn't have the heart to do that, but what would you say? I've been in this situation over and over and over again, and I only have about five minutes to talk with the person, and I'm only seeing them that once. That's what this video is about. Hello, I'm John Foster. I'm a medical doctor who does social security disability exams. I've done over 1,500, and as usual, everything I say reflects my own opinions, based on my own experience and study and not the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. Now in my last video called Disability, My Life is Over, I got the largest number of positive comments I've had from any other video and it seemed to resonate with a lot of disabled folks. So I've decided to make some videos on what I've learned about mental health and disability. Now usually when a doctor encounters a novel disease or something they're not familiar with, they'll go to what we call the medical literature, which is books and journals written for doctors on any topic or disease you care to imagine. But when I started getting these people very upset over their disability, I found nothing in the med medical literature about mental illness or difficulties adjusting to disability. Nothing at all. Which is kind of strange when you think about it because there's over 17 million Americans receiving disability from Social Security at this time, and if my experience is anything to go by, a lot of them are struggling. So I've been working for the last couple of years trying to come up with some things I can say or ways to help these people deal better with the problems that they're facing. I don't claim to have all the answers. In fact, I have very few answers, but there are some things that I've found that help. And my hope is that in this video oh, and the next one, I'll be able to provide some help to people who are struggling to cope with disability. So this video is somewhat different from the ones I've made in the past. It's not about how to get through your disability exam or how to best apply for disability. It's intended for people who are experiencing dif disability and are, are having problems coping with it emotionally and mentally. And this video really is going to reflect my own opinions which are somewhat different from the current teaching in psychiatry. My, I personally feel that recently psychiatry has really let a lot of people down for a number of reasons. One of which is psychiatrists are disappearing at a rapid rate. You probably don't know that psychiatry, on average, is the oldest medical specialty in the United States, and many current psychiatrists are about to retire. Soon, it may be very difficult to find a well-trained, competent psychiatrist anywhere outside of major cities in the United States. 
Another thing is psychiatrists deal with the conditions patients bring to them. There are certain mental conditions that psychiatrists rarely, if ever, see. And it's kind of funny for me to read the psychiatric literature and read that a certain problem, such as a hysterical conversion reaction, is very rare, when in fact I saw lots of them when I was doing emergency medicine. Another issue is that the seriously ill, mentally ill, people in the United States get the least amount of mental health care and the least mentally ill people with mental problems in the United States get the most mental health care. That situation is, again is upside down for a number of reasons. Finally, a lot of people dismiss mental illness as trivial. The fact is, mental illness can be fatal, and unlike most fatal medical conditions, it can be fatal not only for the patient, but sometimes for family members or even pets. During the great financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, I read over and over again in the paper about family sides, where a husband, almost always, would commit suicide while also killing his wife and children and sometimes the family dog. I'm going to include a link in the description to this video to the suicide hotline in case anybody watching it is actually feeling suicidal. Another issue from my point of view is that our view of mental health in our society is very skewed. Unless people are delirious with joy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're thought to have a problem. I don't agree with that at all. Mentally healthy people experience all sorts of difficulties. They get sad, sometimes profoundly sad. They get nervous sometimes profoundly nervous. Being very sad or being very nervous at times do not mean that the person has a mental illness. They sometimes do, but most of the time they don't. I once had an unexpected encounter with an uncaged lion, and let me tell you, I felt nervous. That didn't mean I was mentally ill, it meant I was mentally normal. Luckily, nothing ill happened to either me or the lion, but it was quite the experience. Another concept that I think is ludicrous is that we should all have passion for our work. Sometimes work is just work, and there's a lot of unpleasant work that needs to be done. One of the really interesting things for me about being a doctor is I get to meet people from all different walks of life, and I really enjoy learning about people's different occupations. A couple of years ago, I had a patient who owned a company that pumped out septic tanks, and he told me there's a lot of money in poop and then he showed me some pictures of his very nice collection of classic muscle cars that his business had paid for. Now, I think he was very pleased with the financial compensation, but I doubt that he was really passionate about pumping out septic tanks. Another big error I think people make these days is thinking of the mind and body as two separate things. They're not. The mind comes from our brain, which is an organ in our body. Think about this. If you're suddenly startled, your heart pounds. That's your mind controlling your heart. However, if you're feeling fine and then all of a sudden you notice that your heart is skipping beats, you may be becoming quite an anxious about it. That's your heart controlling your mind. And it's rare that something is all mind or all body. 
And most mental illnesses are not all in the mind. They affect the body as well. The ancient Romans had a saying, mens sana in corpore sano, which means a healthy mind in a healthy body. For them, that was the ideal of good health, and I think they were on to something there. And when I start talking about things that you can do to help cope with disability, I'm going to include some things you can do for your body and for your brain to improve your mental health. Another thing I think it's absolutely crucial to acknowledge is that all people are different. Nobody feels exactly the way you do, and nobody thinks exactly the way you do. Just like nobody looks exactly the way you do, unless you have an identical twin. All sorts of factors go into shaping our personality and thinking and emotions. Those include our heredity, how we were brought up, our relationship with our parents and our other family members, our environment, the conditions under which we were brought up. For example, people brought up during the Great Depression tended to be adverse to taking risks, especially with money. Some of what makes us is luck. Some of us have a lot of good luck, some of us have a lot of bad luck, most of us have a mixture. And finally, some of what determines our thinking and emotion and personality is what we do ourselves, what we have control over. You can't change your heredity, you can't change your upbringing, you can't change your environment, mostly, and you can't change your luck, but you can definitely change things that you do, and I'll be talking about that. Current psychological thinking is that most of what shapes us is how we're brought up, but I think that heredity plays a much bigger role than is generally acknowledged, and any sort of behavior or emotions that we see in other animals mammals and birds mostly, but also some in some social reptiles, has to be heredity. It has to be hardwired in our brains. The next thing is that not all aberrant behavior is mental illness. Some of it is malevolence, in other words, evil. We're afraid of evil to a large extent, so we like to pretend that it doesn't exist. And we, when we read of some heinous crime, such as a serial killer, we like to ascribe that to mental illness. But most of those folks, in my opinion, are not mentally ill. They're mentally healthy and evil. So what would I describe as mental illness? Well, I would say that mental illness is when the person tends to extremes of behavior or emotion, such as extreme sadness or extreme anxiety, when that is persistent, doesn't last a day or two, lasts weeks, months, or years, and is maladaptive makes life worse for the person and or other people that the person deals with, such as family members or as people they deal with at work. So a mental illness would be, for example, extreme sadness that lasts for months or years and makes life worse for the person and their family members, and that would be clinical depression. Sadness is part of depression, but not all sadness is depression. Mourning is something that happens with mentally healthy people, and there is great sadness associated with mourning. Mourning is genetic. We see animals mourn, especially the death of their children. 
all loss causes mourning, and that includes the loss of good health. Next, I think that today mental illness is way overdiagnosed. Too many people are called mentally ill when they're really just variations of normal or people going through difficult circumstances who are mentally healthy. And there's, there's a reason for that. Our definition of mental illnesses comes from what's called the DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Ma Manual of Psychiatry, 5th edition. And this is the Bible of, for psychiatry on how to diagnose mental illness. And here's the problem. There is billions of dollars involved. In the United States, insurance, whether that's private insurance or socialized insurance, such as Medicare, Medicaid, and VA insurance, will only pay for treatment if the person has a disease, with some exceptions for preventative care. So example, Insurance will only pay for psychotherapy and antidepressants if a person is diagnosed with depression. There is a huge financial incentive for drug companies that make drugs to treat mental illness to have as many people diagnosed mentally ill as possible because if the diagnosis is mentally healthy, insurance will not pay for their medications. That's resulted in an epidemic of overdiagnosis. The next thing is what I call ridiculous diagnoses. When I was t taught some psychiatry in medical school and in my medical residency, and we were taught to find the one diagnosis that would account for the patient's problems. Quite a few people had two diagnoses, usually a basic diagnosis like depression and a secondary addiction like depression and alcoholism. Three diagnoses was very rare. Now, all the time, I see people with three, four, five, six psychiatric diagnoses, and it's just ridiculous. For example, I see people who tell me they have bipolar illness and depression. The old name for bipolar illness that I was taught is manic depression, and to be diagnosed with bipolar, you have to have episodes of mania and depression. Only an incompetent person would diagnose somebody with bipolar illness and depression. It's impossible. Part of the overdiagnosis is the idea that anybody who has any difficult part of life now has post-traumatic stress disorder. That's not true. In fact, most people who undergo a traumatic experience develop what's called post-traumatic growth syndrome. They learn that they're able to overcome and live through a traumatic situation and get on with their life. It's only a minority of people who experience emotional trauma who develop post-traumatic stress disorder. In fact, most of us have no idea of our ability to survive difficult times. I have a friend who's a retired Navy SEAL, and part of SEAL training is called Hell Week. It comes at the end of their basic training and involves subjecting the trainees to the most severe and difficult situations possible. No sleep, freezing, no food, etc., etc. And I think a major reason why this is included in the training is it teaches these folks that they can survive and continue to function through more difficult circumstances that they, than they had ever imagined possible. 
One thing that every survivor of trauma has learned is that they can survive trauma. Well, I hope this has been helpful. In my next video, I'm going to, pre to describe some concrete things that people who are disabled and are having difficulty coping can do to perhaps help with their coping and improve their life. And as always, remember, if it happens, it's possible.